everybody. Today we are going to learn about steel. We're going to learn how steel is cold. May, and if, if you like the video, please, please put a like and make sure this to subscribe. Let's see, Laren Thomas teach now. Hi, I'm Laren. This is Knife Steel Nerds. So it's uh, winter time out, so it's time to talk about cryo and cold treatments. And recently I got some steaks in the mail that had dry ice in the package. So I made the decision real quick to do some heat treatments using the dry ice. So I took AEBL and I heat treated it both with room temperature quenching, with my household freezer, with dry ice, and with liquid nitrogen, and I compared the hardness and the toughness with all of those different heat treatments. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting things that I found. I'll explain what happened, why it happened, how cryo and cold treatments work, and how they don't work, and answer all of your questions. So let's get to it. First, I cut out the coupons and labeled them with a white paint marker. The white paint turns black when heat treating in foil, and so you can maintain the labels. Wrapping the steel in stainless heat treating foil helps to prevent scale formation and loss of carbon, called decarburization. Is that steel? Mm-hmm. Why not? It has to look like rubber things. Rubber things? That are holding the steel inside it. Nope, it's steel holding steel. The steel was placed in a preheated furnace and then held at temperature for 15 minutes. Then I plate quenched between two aluminum plates. This helps to maintain flatness while cooling faster than sitting in air. AEBL can be cooled in air, but faster cooling can mean a bit higher hardness. One coupon I left at room temperature, one coupon I put in my freezer, one in the isopropyl alcohol and dry ice, and one in liquid nitrogen. Make sure the alcohol has stopped violently boiling, which indicates that it has reached the approximate temperature of the dry ice. I'm filming myself putting a piece of steel in a freezer. After quenching, I tested the hardness, and also after tempering at 300 and 350 degrees Fahrenheit. The first surprise was that the dry ice was more similar to the freezer than it was to the liquid nitrogen in terms of hardness. Cooling to room temperature resulted in the lowest hardness, as expected, with a big drop in hardness when austenitizing from 2025 degrees. The peak hardness was at about 1950 degrees for room temperature quenching, but this was increased to at least 2025 degrees when using liquid nitrogen. When you heat steel to high temperature, it transforms from the magnetic ferrite phase to the non-magnetic austenite phase. Austenite is able to accommodate carbon within the iron matrix, while ferrite largely cannot. So at the austenitizing temperature, some of the carbides are dissolved, putting carbon in solution prior to quenching. With the rapid cooling during the quench, the carbon is locked in, so that instead of transforming back to ferrite, it transforms to a high hardness phase called martensite. The transformation to martensite is primarily controlled by temperature, not time, with a martensite start temperature and a martensite finish temperature. The finish temperature can be somewhat fuzzy, so sometimes it is given as a 95% or 99% transformed temperature. This start and finish temperature is controlled by how much carbon and other alloying elements are in solution. More carbon and more alloy means a lower temperature where martensite forms. So with a higher austenitizing temperature, there is more carbon and chromium in solution because more carbide was dissolved, which reduces the temperature range at which martensite forms. If the martensite finish temperature is below room temperature, then some of the austenite remains untransformed, and this is called retained austenite. 
Retained austenite reduces steel hardness, though in small amounts can mean an increase in toughness. Another complicating factor with cold treatments is the delay in time between the quench and the cold treatment. If the steel is allowed to sit at room temperature, some of the retained austenite will stabilize and the cold treatment will transform less austenite to martensite and less increase in hardness. In an old study on T1 high-speed steel, they compared different cold temperatures after holding at room temperature for different periods of time. They found that dry ice was nearly as good as liquid nitrogen as long as there was no delay between the quench and the cold treatment. A freezer had about half the effect of dry ice if it was placed in the freezer immediately after the quench. Liquid nitrogen had a flat effect up to about an hour, after which it became steadily less effective. Because of this previous study, I was somewhat surprised that I found a significant difference between liquid nitrogen and dry ice. However, AEBL has more carbon and chromium in solution than T1, especially at high austenitizing temperatures, so the martensite transformation temperatures would be lower than T1 and therefore show greater differences between the different cold treatments. Another surprise finding with this study was that the AEBL I tested had lower hardness than the previous AEBL I used for cold treatment studies. This new AEBL required about 50 degrees higher austenitizing temperature than the original. I realized this was because the AEBL was produced by Buderis rather than Udahome. One of the prominent knife steel suppliers sells Buderis X65CR13 as AEBL because the composition is the same and both Buderis and Udahome have the same parent company. However, there is a difference in microstructure between the two products which leads to a different heat treatment response. Unfortunately, it can be difficult to determine the ultimate source of the ABL because this knife steel supplier buys Budera steel in bulk and also sells it to some other knife steel suppliers. I wouldn't necessarily call the Budera steel bad, but because of the difference in heat treatment response, you need to know what product you have to know how to heat treat it. This means that the temperature I selected for toughness testing, 1925 degrees, was not exactly what I was shooting for, but we can still hopefully make some conclusions from the results. All of the specimens were tempered at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. The room temperature quench steel was about 59.5 Rockwell C. The dry ice and freezer had similar hardness, around 60 to 60.5 Rockwell. In fact, the freezer coupons were slightly harder just from the natural variation between coupons. The liquid nitrogen cooled coupon had the highest hardness, just over 61 Rockwell. The toughness was slightly reduced from the increase in hardness from cold treatments, but the drop in toughness was small enough that the increase in hardness was probably worth it. The toughness was slightly lower than the previously tested Udahome AEBL, which is again probably due to the difference in microstructure. A similar difference in toughness was seen between Udahome AEBL and Buderis produced Nitro V. The change in toughness with cryo is different between different steels and from different austenitizing temperatures. In a study I did along with Warren Cryco on Z-Wear, the change in toughness was small enough that it was within the noise of the test. With 52100, a small drop in toughness was observed with cryo even when compensating for hardness. There are a couple studies reported in journal articles where the drop in toughness with cryo was significantly larger, such as dropping the toughness of LMAX by half with dry ice or liquid nitrogen. I have not seen such extreme drops in toughness, so I'm not sure what led to such poor values in the case of LMAX in this study. When looking at the hardness after tempering, the trend lines of hardness can change somewhat. Tempering is typically used to increase toughness and generally it reduces hardness. However, in certain temperature ranges, tempering can lead to an increase in hardness. This is most commonly seen with high alloy and high speed steels where tempering in the range of about 900 to 1100 degrees Fahrenheit leads to higher hardness. This tempering range is very common in the tool and die industry. However, tempering in a very low temperature range of about 200 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit can also lead to an increase in hardness. What happens during tempering is that some of the carbon locked in the martensite is allowed to diffuse out by precipitating as very tiny carbides. Very small carbides can increase hardness of steel. With more tempering, the size of the carbides increases and have less of an effect on hardness. Then the loss of hardness from the martensite diffusing carbon out takes over, which leads to an overall loss in hardness. Occasionally, the increase in hardness from these tempering carbides is misunderstood as being something that only shows up in a hardness test, but is not a true increase in the strength of the material. However, this is not the case. The increase in strength is also observed in other types of strength tests and is seen within the iron matrix itself. The matrix is actually stronger. 
Anyway, the ABL generally saw an increase in hardness when tempering at 300 degrees, followed by a drop when tempered at 350. That increase in hardness at 300 degrees meant that the hardness was still higher when tempering at 350. This increase in hardness with a 300 degree temper was generally greater when austenitizing at a higher temperature. A higher austenitize meant more carbon in solution so that more carbides precipitate during tempering. When austenitizing at 1900, there was a drop in hardness measured after tempering at 300 degrees. This means that if we compare the effect of cold treatments after tempering, the trends are somewhat different. The peak hardness of the room temperature quench specimens was found at 1975 to 2000 degrees rather than 1950 because of the bump in hardness after tempering. And the dry ice and freezer specimens looked a bit more similar to liquid nitrogen until the 2025 degree austenitize where they diverged. Another improvement that has been observed with cryogenic processing is an improvement in wear resistance. Sometimes there are claims that cryogenic processing can lead to incredible increases in wear resistance, like six and a half times the baseline heat treatment. Journal article reports are usually more reasonable, but the measured improvement can be mixed, and it can be challenging to determine if it was an increase in wear resistance due to hardness alone, or whether cryogenic processing can lead to an improvement in wear resistance even after controlling for hardness. This is a surprisingly controversial area. There are many journal articles claiming an improvement in wear resistance from cryo even after controlling for hardness, but many metallurgists reject these claims. One example is Rafael Mesquita in his book Tool Steel's Properties and Performance, which was published in 2016. He said there exist several sources in the literature positing that long cryogenic treatments may lead to an improvement in toughness and wear resistance, claiming that significant microstructural changes such as carbide precipitation as the main cause. However, scientific explanations and the confirmation of measured properties are still not clear, and it is possible that the effects are only caused by the transformation of retained austenite. As he says, there are some journal articles where it is claimed that there are different carbides formed from cryogenic processing either during the cryo itself or afterward during tempering, and they state that these carbides lead to an improvement in wear resistance. However, in a literature review I did for a cryo article I did a few years ago, I found that there was no consistent improvement in wear resistance reported, and in fact many studies found no improvement or even a small decrease in wear resistance. One of the most cited studies is one in which D2 steel was cooled to cryogenic temperatures for different periods of time and the wear resistance measured. They reported that holding for 36 hours led to an improvement in wear resistance after controlling for hardness, but that at other hold times this effect was not observed. So I did a catcher test where I heat treated two D2 blades, one that had no cryo treatment and one that was held in liquid nitrogen for 36 hours. I tempered the one with the cryo treatment at a bit higher temperature to try to achieve the same hardness, but the cryo blade ended up being somewhat softer. When measuring the edge retention from wear in the catcher test, the blade with no cryo ended up being superior because of the slightly higher hardness. I would think that if the 36 hour cryo was leading to a significant improvement in wear resistance, this wouldn't have mattered. So I don't think that cryo was doing anything to edge wear apart from potentially increasing hardness. There was another catcher study on 154CM and CPM154 that I did not perform. Uh, I did the analysis and reported the results on my website. They looked at the effect of cryo and also found no difference. In that case, there were some cryo apologists who said that because the steel was tempered at 1000 degrees Fahrenheit that the tempering carbides from that temperature would not see the improvement from cryo. However, in the D2 catcher study, I use 400 to 500 degree tempering, so that argument won't work for this case. Okay, let's answer some common questions about cryo and cold treatments. One, uh, which steels require cryo? Oh, no steel really requires cryo, as long as you don't austenitize too high. If you're austenitizing beyond the point where you have peak hardness, then you're gonna get excess retained austenite, which will reduce the strength of your steel. Now, some steels, are limited in hardness without cryo. Some steels are limited to 63, 64 Rockwell, but some steels like LC200N or Vanex are limited more to like 60 or 61. Uh, they get their high corrosion resistance from a lot of chromium in solution, and that chromium reduces martensite start and increases retained austenite. So without cryo, you might be limited to like uh, 58, 59 Rockwell. Okay, do carbon steels benefit from cryo. There's a common myth that nothing happens with carbon steels or low alloy steels during cryo, uh, but they can increase in hardness just like stainless steels or high alloy tool steels can. Uh, like O1, 52100, W2, they've all been shown to increase in hardness with cryo. We did a study on 52100 and found about a one Rockwell C increase with cryogenic processing with a small reduction in toughness along with it. 
Oh, how long do you need to hold at the cold temperature? So usually 60 minutes is fine. You just need to get it down to the temperature. Martensite forms basically instantly once it reaches the temperature. It's not limited by time. Uh, all of the studies on extended cryo times are about increased wear resistance from carbide precipitation. And like I said, that's not really well proven. Oh, should you temper before cold treatment? So tempering before a cold treatment reduces the chance of warping or cracking, but it also reduces the effectiveness of the cold treatment. Just like we discussed with holding at room temperature, it stabilizes the retained austenite. So I don't recommend doing it. Okay, uh, is a freezer cold enough to make a difference? Yeah, the colder you get, the more martensite that will form. Okay, thank you to my Patreon supporters for supporting these kinds of experiments and to my new supporters that we've gotten over the past month or two. So oh, thanks everyone. Your support helps us do these kinds of experiments. They can be very expensive. So thank you for supporting Knife Steel Nerds. Until next time. Oh, it's freaking freezing out here. Oh, it's so cold.